simply look at it on the basis I'll just toss in the towel. It is hopeless and there's nothing that I can do about it. The Apostle Paul, in dealing with the believers at Philippi, uh, over and over and over again in the Philippians epistle, talked about rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He was encouraging, by the way, he was in prison when he wrote those words, but he was encouraging the believers at Philippi to find peace in the Lord. And I think that's a lesson and a direction that we need to have in our lives today. So I want us to think a moment about how to find peace. How to find peace. There are four things that I want us to notice about real peace or how to find peace. We see the prerequisite of peace revealed. We see the prescription for peace recorded. We look at the promise for peace reminded and the program for peace reviewed. So I want us to notice as we look at verse 6, notice what the scripture says. Notice, first of all, the problem considered. It says, be careful for nothing. The problem is not just uh, considering a situation. The problem is not just surveying a situation. The problem is not just looking at the situation and analyzing. There's nothing wrong with analyzing and scrutinizing a situation. I do that every day as we face the issues on the radio broadcast. I look at the scenario, their circumstances, and the issues, and I try to analyze them from the perspective of what is the answer from a Christian biblical worldview. So as we consider the situation and survey the situation, circumstance, uh, we need to look at it, but not brood over it, not worry about it, and not constantly be pondering it. In fact, someone says worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's uh, opportunities with yesterday's troubles. (laughs) Worry is trying to solve our own problems. Worry is looking at it on the basis that uh, there's nothing that we can do about it, and so we're just going to worry about it rather than allowing the Lord to be in control. We are to be prepared for the future, and in that preparation for the future, it does not include anything called worry. That's the problem considered. Be careful for nothing. But notice the precaution that is commanded there. Be careful. That word means anxious, worried, fretting for nothing. That means for not anything, not any little thing, not any big thing, that we're not to worry about it. It is simply, if you put it in the young blood vernacular, do not worry. Don't be fretful. Don't be anxious about anything. That means to have care and concern overly speaking. There's nothing wrong with caring about something. There's nothing wrong with being concerned about an issue. There's a whole lot wrong with it if we're going to worry about it. The Apostle Paul says, don't worry. Don't worry about anything, big thing or little thing. Anything and everything should be in the hands of the Lord. People worry about finances and family and friends and future, and we are mainly concerned at this juncture in the life of America to worry about the election and to be concerned about what is taking place with our nation if we make the wrong decision at the ballot box. There is a major concern with that, and that ought to be so. We ought to scrutinize it and analyze it and understand what's on the horizon if we make the wrong choice as Americans at the ballot box in the next several days. But did you know that 90% of the things that we worry about never take place? 90% of the things that we're anxious about never take place? Jesus cautioned Martha uh, not to worry in Luke chapter 10, verse 41. And Jesus answered and said unto Martha, 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 thou art careful, that means to worry or be anxious, and trouble, that is perplexed, about many things. Uh, Jesus says, you're worried and you're threatening and you're concerning. I could just picture in that setting, she's darting to and fro in the house, trying to get things ready, trying to take care of things. And Jesus says, in essence, you're worried about too many things. You're anxious over too many things. In fact, Jesus cautioned his disciples about worry. In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 25, we read these words. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor for your body what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, notice, feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which are you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto your statue? 
and that and why take ye thought that is dealing with care, worry consideration anxiousness for raiment consider the lilies of the field how they grow they uh, toil not neither do they spin and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these wherefore if God uh, if God so clothed the grass of the field which is today and is and tomorrow is cast into the oven shall he not much more clothe you O ye of little faith notice in that 31st verse therefore take no thought worry anxiousness and concern saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or whether with all shall we be clothed for all of these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of all these things but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you the problem is so often we fail to recognize the admonitions and the directions in the scripture that charges us not to worry. In fact, in John 14, 1, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Worry is absolutely out of the picture for what the scripture says. Worry is doubt. Doubt is the lack of faith. And we need to faith God. We need to understand not only the prerequisite of peace revealed, but notice the prescription for peace recorded in verse 6, the latter portion. What is the cure? What's the answer for the anxiousness and the worriedness that we find so often in society? I believe that this affects Christians just as much as it does the world. I believe that it affects those in society, whether it's in the church, out of the church, but it ought not to be in the household of faith at all. Notice, first of all, the priority commended there. But in everything, that is in each and everything, every little thing, every big thing, let your request be made known unto God. There's an old song that says, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. In fact, in First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all of your cares upon him, for he cares for you. It is the need to understand as Christians that God cares for us, and he's asking us to come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is the Lord that has every need. We must remember, as it is found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, a text that many misplace and misunderstand. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to Kata, based upon his purpose for our lives. One of the major problems that we fail to recognize is, as we go through circumstances and situations, if we love the Lord, Everything that takes place based on his sovereign care brings together that which is good. It is good for us and it's good for God in us honoring him and his honor and glory in his position. How do we take our cares and concerns <clears throat> and anxieties to the Lord? Notice the procedure that's chronicled there in that verse. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. There's an old song that says, Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's all that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Most of the time, as Christians, we will gripe and bellyache and be concerned and anxious and worried over a situation rather than by prayer and supplication taking it to the Lord. Now, I've had many down through the years ask the question, well, what's the difference in prayers and supplications? It's very, very clear as you study the scripture. First of all, notice prayers. Prayer. Prayer comes from the word that emphasizes prayer as an act of worship. It is an act of worship when we go before the Lord and we pray. It is our approach to God. It is coming before him. It's falling on our face, whether it is uh, physical or whether it is in our hearts, before our face in humility, before the throne of God, bringing our request before him. It is our admiration for him. It is our adoration for him. It is our uh, honor before him in humility. How often do we miss God's peace because we fail to come to him in prayer. Secondly, not only, we're talking about the procedure chronicled. First of all, prayers. Secondly, petitions. That word supplication means a cry out to God for a personal, specific need. It is the supplication. Someone said in their understanding of the word, earnest request, entreaty before God. It says in the uh, definition of that, it is the picture of a petitioner as a subject who comes in humility before the Lord with a need that must be met. 
That's a pretty prescriptive understanding of supplication. So it's our prayer which is an act of worship. It's our petitions which is the uh, burning desire of our heart that we bring before the Lord. And notice the praise then with thanksgiving. Our prayers and our petitions need to be coupled with a praise and thanksgiving. As we pray, the question begs to be asked and demands to be answered. How many times do we as Christians pray for something and never say thank you, thank you, thank you for hearing the prayer? It's always, well, I'm going to wait and see if God does that, and then I'll thank him. No time we make that petition, time we make that supplication, we should say, thank you, thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for hearing the petition. Thank you for the answer. In fact, in Psalms 103 and verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Prayer and praise should be coupled with thanksgiving. As we pray to the Lord, we need to thank him. How would we feel as a parent, if a child was always coming to us and saying, do this for me, take care of this, and give me this, and he never says, thank you, Daddy, thank you, Mama, thank you for what you've done for me. There's another old song that says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry to the, it to the Lord in prayer. That is the problem that we find. Someone said, we are to be careful for nothing, prayerful for everything, and thankful for anything. It's a pretty powerful statement. Let me share that again. We are to be careful for nothing, prayerful for everything, and thankful for anything. That's a pretty broad brush of how we ought to live our lives. God wants us to come boldly before his throne. In fact, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 16th verse, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It is not brazenly that we come before God, but it's boldly, realizing that he already knows the heart, he already knows the life, he already knows the need, and we're to come boldly, not shamefully, not bashfully, not uh, with a backup approach, but to come boldly before the throne and making our prayers and our petitions known with thanksgiving. Not only do we see the prerequisite for peace revealed and the prescription for peace recorded, but I want you to notice the third thing in verse 7, the promise for peace reminded. Notice the peace committed and, the scripture says, and the peace, that's the serenity, that's the quietness of heart, of God which passes, that is literally to transcend, it goes beyond all understanding. Have you ever seen someone that's in the midst of the problem, in the midst of a whirlwind, and it seems as though they're just as calm and collected and as peaceful as they can be, and yet you know all of the problems, all of the difficulties, all the things they're faced with, and you're just marveled at their stability and their serenity in the midst of the storm. In fact, peace literally means freedom from anxiety. Peace means freedom from worry. Peace means rest and contentment and quietness of heart, even in the midst of the problem. And that is a need in most every Christian life today. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, anxious, worried, neither let it be afraid, terrorized. Literally, if you look at the word. Notice a couple of things about that. First of all, it's supernatural. It's not normal to have peace in the midst of the problem. It's not normal to have peace in the middle of the situation, which passeth all understanding. That literally means it's beyond compreh uh, comprehension. It's beyond what we can understand. It's beyond what we can rationalize uh, from the human perspective. Peace, that is tranquility and quietness of the heart, in the midst of trial and tribulation and trouble, is not understood, generally speaking, by most of us, and especially the world. The world's watching the Christian and how we face problems and difficulties and tribulation in our lives. Not only it's supernatural, it's sure. Didn't say maybe, but it says shall, that's positive, shall keep. That is not maybe, it is not perhaps, it is positive, it's sure. It's a guarantee coming from the word of God. We have a divine commitment. It is from a holy God that says that when we come to him and bring our prayers and our petition, our supplication with thanksgiving, that he is going to quiet our hearts and quiet our worry and quiet the anxiety and quiet the fears and bring tranquility in our hearts and in our lives. It's supernatural, it's sure, and it's also security. It is security. It is a uh, secure factor 
Notice keep literally means as a sentinel. That's the little word tereo in the Greek text. It means to encircle. Notice what the scripture is saying in that security. It means to watch over, to guard, to garrison about, to surround, to protect your hearts and minds. If we follow the prescription that is given, rather than worrying, if we will place it before the Lord, coming boldly before him with our prayers and our petitions and our supplications, and we do so with thanksgiving, there's the assurance that he's going to keep, guard, and protect our hearts and our minds. Encircling us. When we worry, Satan is in control of our emotions. When we worry, when we're anxious and we're upset and have the feeling that somehow, some way we're forlorn and that nothing can be resolved, it is when Satan takes hold of the emotions and the mind. But when we take it to the Lord, he gives protection and peace and he encircles our heart with that protection and peace. How is this done? Notice not only the peace committed, but notice the pathway conveyed. The pathway conveyed is through, that's the little Greek word, dia, by way of Jesus Christ. It's an impossibility to have peace in your heart and your life and mind and our mind without Jesus Christ being on the throne of our lives. He must be there to rule and to guide and to guard and to direct. The world's uh, uh, situation and the psychology of life today uh, will talk about how there's this need for counseling, there's this need for these other things, but the scripture is very, very clear. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ that he can encircle our hearts, encircle our minds, and bring about peace that the world cannot offer. The world and other realms of psychology all the material goods cannot provide peace, but Jesus Christ can provide peace. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ is priceless. Money can't buy it. You can't work for it. Power cannot obtain it. Position cannot get it. It is peace as a result of coming before the Lord with our prayers and our petitions and those supplications with thanksgiving, and the peace of God will encircle our hearts and our minds, the Scripture says. The question is, do we have that relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ? Without that relationship to Jesus Christ as being saved, 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 that promise and that commitment and that assurance and that guarantee of peace cannot be found in the world in which we're living. The prerequisite of peace revealed. The prescription for peace recorded. The promise for peace reminded. But I want us to notice in verses 8 and 9, the plan for peace reviewed. The plan. Notice the Apostle Paul says in verse 89, finally. Finally. Someone says, you know what it means when a preacher, preacher says finally? Not one thing. <laughs> Not one thing. A little boy was listening to a preacher preach and sitting next to his mother. And he looked over at his mother's watch and he says, Mama, you think the preacher's watch is broken? Uh, there are a lot of people that will look at it when you say finally. But here's the Apostle Paul saying finally. Finally, notice the program communicated. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and it's the word if is the Greek word uh, since, since there be any virtue, in, uh, if there be any praise, since there is praise, think on these things. Notice what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's in prison. But he is saying that this is where our hearts and minds ought to be stayed. And that is the greatest conflict, the greatest danger, the greatest enemy that we have is in the mind of an individual. It's in the mind. Anything that takes place in our hearts and our lives starts out in the mind. And here's where the greatest problem, greatest conflict, the greatest battle, the greatest wage of war against the Christian today. It's not political. It's not social. It's not economic. The greatest conflict in the battle is in the mind of the believer. Daily, we're bombarded with hundreds and hundreds of commercials. Have you ever watched any of the goofy commercials on television? I don't know about you, but I get a little weary with them. Wish there was some way to push the button and it goes, psh, goes right on over the commercial and gets back to uh, the news that I'm watching generally when that takes place. But these commercials have some way about trying to bombard the mind. 
In fact, if a commercial can get you entertained through it, to listen to it, to watch it, and to start analyzing it with your mind, generally speaking, you'll buy that product or you will endeavor in that that they are promoting on that uh, ad on television or as you listen to it on radio. If the advertiser can control your thoughts about the product, you'll buy the product. In fact, there's one that's a car ad. If you drive a Subaru, you'll buy a Subaru. That's a pretty inductive communication. So he's urging to drive. You don't have to buy it, just drive it. But if you drive it, you're going to buy it. That's because it's the mind that controls that. It's the mind. The politicians want to control your minds. Uh, it is a fact that we have the politicians today and the news media today that's bombarding us with all that's about COVID-19. On the news this afternoon, on three of the different networks that I turned to, said we're on the very cusp, we're on the very beginning of another wave of death across America. One, one article on CNN, the Communist Network News, said we could have as much as another quarter million people in America die as a result of COVID-19. That is making the mind bring about hysteria, and hysteria bringing about fear. Fear will cause submission to anything the government says. It's the mind that is taking place. Someone says, it's mind over matter. If you don't mind, it won't matter. And that's uh, the whole thing that seems to be taking place today. But it's talking about the mind. The news media will attempt to control our minds. There's an attempt to control what we think about the sodomite lifestyle today in marriage, a uh, control in the minds about the so-called legality of De uh, murder by way of abortion, the legality of the extramarital sex and the uh, mindset that there's uh, gender fluid, that there are over 100 different genders supposedly today. And the mindset is to hear it, to listen to it, and the fake, false, phony Communist Network news will try to get the public to believe that. And that movement is underway today to try to change the attitude and the mindset of America in what we believe and what we do and what we're going to think in relationship to social medicine in the way of giving anything everything free and the mindset of the Green New Deal and I could go on and on and on. It's bombarding the mind to get the mind open to receive and embrace the New Deal that's being offered today politically speaking. It attempts to control our view. To control our view as you stand and have a news commentator standing there with a microphone in his hand talking about the riots are peaceful, the demonstrations are peaceful. Behind you you see uh, things that are blowing up and buildings that's on fire, but telling you this is a peaceful demonstration. It is the mind that they're trying to control that we're faced with today. And it's the mind that the Apostle Paul is thinking about and talking about. Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And that's what is so needed today. If Satan can control the mind, he can control the actions and the words and the deeds. The Apostle Paul talked about that in Romans the 7th chapter, verses 15 through verse 20, with the key verse being, he says, he's talking about wrestling with his mind, wrestling with what he ought to do and what he ought not to do in the 7th chapter of the book of Romans. Verse 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? May I remind us the Apostle Paul wrestled with the attack by Satan on his mind to try to get him to defer and to desist in being and doing what the Lord Jesus Christ had called him to do. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, Will thou keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee? It's keeping our mind focused on spiritual things, honorable things, things that will honor the Lord in and through our lives. We are to be anxious for nothing. That is, to be fretful and worried about nothing in our lives. Our thoughts and our hearts should be focused on six things that the Apostle Paul lists there. And I'll cover them quickly. Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. That means just and impartial and fair. Whatsoever things are just, that means honorable and virtuous, right before the Lord. Whatsoever things are pure, that means unadulterated with evil, untainted by evil, pure in morals and motives in what we say and what we do. 
whatsoever things are lovely. That is a word here. By the way, it's an interesting study if time would allow to develop it further. It's a word that's in the New Testament here only one time here in the New Testament. It's a term that's used to describe the fine art and music of that era and that day. That means here whatsoever things are lovely. That means attractive for Christian character, peerless in excellence in what is done in and through the life of a believer. Whatsoever things of good report. That is praiseworthy, deserving, worthy and honorable to be noted as praiseworthy from the Lord. All these thoughts are opposite from what Satan would have the mind to think, to hear, and to understand and believe. If the peace of God is in control of our lives, we must take our steps that's necessary to fill our hearts and our minds with the Word of God. Clean, pure, honest, virtuous thoughts. We must meditate on them and dwell on those thoughts. If there be any virtue, that's the concept of moral excellency, or any praise, that's the concept of verbal communication and excellence, think on, that is literally dwell on, concentrate on, meditate on these things. It's a powerful order for a Christian is to think on these things. First comes the conflict, one said, over our minds and thoughts. Then comes the concentration over our meditation and dwelling. Then comes control over our lives and what we do and say. It's what we think and meditate on that's carried out in the heart and the life of the child of God and for the individual in general, but it is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. The program communicated. But notice in that ninth verse, the practice, the practical communicated. What is practical in doing this? Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Notice the four things that the Apostle Paul says. Those things that you've learned, those things that you've received, those things that you've heard, those things that you've seen. Learned is personal instruction. Those things that you've received, personal inculcation. Heard, those things that are personal indoctrination. Those things that you've seen, that's personal illumination. The Apostle Paul says, see me, follow me, do as I do. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying those things that you, those things that you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. He's saying, you follow me as an example. But here's Paul in prison simply for preaching the gospel. And yet he's saying, follow me, be obedient to me. Can you imagine the Christians in that day say, but oh, Paul, if I follow you, I'll be in jail. If I follow you, they want to take my head off. If I follow you, look what they're going to do to me. But Paul is saying, I'm the example because there are other places in his communication and his other epistles. He says, mimic me as I mimic, mimic Christ. And that ought to be the mindset that we have is to mimic what the Word of God says and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to have the concepts. We must have the right conduct. Not enough to have the, or to perceive something. We must practice what we are perceiving and understand according to the Scripture. The Apostle Paul says, I'm the example. My life is the example. My life is written before you. I've lived it before you. I have that intimate fellowship with you. And I'm saying just mimic me, follow me. Let me be the example. We can't just talk. We must walk. We must practice. We must show in personal, practical conduct what we believe. What are the results? Notice the ninth verse, the latter portion as we close. Notice the presence committed. And the God of peace, and the God of peace, and the God of peace shall be with you. We're talking about serenity. We're talking about peace. We're talking about the joy of peace that comes in surpassing all understanding as we bring our prayers and petitions before the Lord and be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto the Lord. It's promised peace from God. Someone said, and I quote, living surpasses learning and practice surpasses preaching. It is to practice what we say. It is to live what we've learned from the Word of God. We need to understand that God is charging us with the responsibility of having.